What's up? This is Kyle Pfeiffer, Blacklight District, and you are listening to Rock at Night. I've been listening to you guys for fucking ever, dude. Black, yeah, man. Cold as ice helped me get through some tough shit and uh, with my ex back in the day. So, yeah, that's I, man, it means a lot, bro. Seriously. And again, like I tell a lot of my fans and stuff, like I write a lot of this music too, like going through situations like that, other situations, you know, like I try to always express that in the music as much as possible. And I don't know, I guess in my opinion, I've always felt like that's why certain people could connect with my music, you know, is because of things like that. So no, dude, that's awesome to hear, man. And I'm glad the music could be there. You know what I'm saying? Hell yeah, man. I mean, that's kind of what music is about. It's, it's about expression and, you know, it, in a lot of ways, it, it really saves people. It helps people through the darkest of times and the best of times. Dude, so. I'm telling you, the, the DMs I get like on Instagram and Twitter and stuff like that from a lot of these younger kids, too, that'll say, man, like this music, you know, got me through this depression or I mean, I've had people say they've almost killed themselves. You, you, I mean, dude, just everything. And honestly, like for me, at the end of the day, the last couple of years, I've had like life changing success in terms of my life and revenue and things like that. But at the end of the day, man, like, I don't know, for me, nothing hits as hard as like the music, just having such a connection with someone. To me, that's better than any money or fame. Like to, to, to know that like someone is hearing the music, how I grew up listening to the artist I loved and connected with, you know what I'm saying? Ultimate, right. in my opinion. Hey man, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what it's about. And I'm glad that you enjoy making the music you do and that the fans enjoy making the music that you do, you know? Yeah. Um, he knows fans. Huh? It's funny. Yeah. Uh, Cause I was talking to Tom and he sent me his roster and I saw your band. I was like, no way. I know those guys. I was like, dude, I totally <laughs> want to set up an interview to, to speak to, to speak to them, you know, because they've, they helped me out through some tough shit and, you know, I just love their music. It's catchy. It's fresh. And it's a nice melding and mixing of genres. It's kind of a, I don't want to label it as new metal, but I definitely get new metal vibes from it. You know, the, the introduction of, you know, the lyricism and then the, the heavy riffs that go with it, you know, and in a time where it seems like new metal is kind of fading into like obscurity, you guys are there with like a fresh spin. So I, I really, I really dig that. I think that's a big part of your charm when it comes to your music. For sure, man. And it's crazy because like, you know, in like the year 2000, when like Lincoln Park and Corn and all that shit was happening, I was like nine years old, 10 years old, you know? And so I remember all that. I mean, like even the Limp Biscuit stuff, all sorts of crazy stuff back then. And then I feel like, you know, over the next, you know, from then to today, you know, with like Octane and like Sirius XM, like those types of things, those types of artists, there's a lot of that like new metal influence in there for sure. And then I feel like a lot of people are putting more like hip hop stuff in there. And I mean, if you've listened to me, you know, I have some of that too. And so, yeah, man, I think, I think it's like, you know, a part of me wanted to kind of distance myself from that for a while because of exactly what you said, how like rock or like the new metal stuff, hard rock, whatever you want to call it. Like, you know, it's like faded from the mainstream culture for sure. But like, you know, getting into like the Minecraft videos and some of these other types of things that I've done. It's really like, for example, Cold as Ice, the Minecraft video has like 71 million views. And like those, I mean, you know, those are like getting close to like pop star numbers. So it's almost cool that I look at it like the Minecraft thing, like a song like Cold as Ice blew it up, got it a hundred million streams. Whereas if it was only just on like rock radio and the typical kind of thing, it would have never reached that level. You know what I mean? So it's just cool to be able to do things that like the music industry would consider like outside the box in terms of doing like anime videos. You know, a label is not thinking of that as their first pri- uh, promotional option, you know? So it, dude, it's been, it's been incredible, man, to reach people 
in a different way than just the standard shit, you know? Well, that's definitely thinking outside the box, man. As, as you said, the whole Minecraft thing, cause it, you know, you're right. Radio kind of puts everyone in a niche, you know, it, you're, you're inside the box, but then you're right. You have like these Japanese anime videos, you have, the you know streamers who are playing you know video games like as you said minecraft or apex or something like that and you have you know your songs behind it you know like an amv and that's exactly you know the the invention of amvs because i was watching amvs in high school back in like 2005 and stuff so (laughs) you know and that's really how a lot of kids who didn't just want to sit there and just you know listen to just you know a, a picture of an album you know, they right. want to actually be able to play a game or watch a game or watch a stream or do something and listen to something catchy. You know, it just, yeah, it, you're right. That all melds really together. Way, you know, because yeah, it's great like, marketing, dude. <laughs> dude well, and, and most of the time, I mean, you know, when you're working a song to radio, that shit gets expensive for the artist or label who, who's ever funding the project. I mean, like, like, you know, I mean, you can spend 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars just trying to get one song on the radio because each you know it's just it's insane some of the costs of this but then again finding a partner or someone on youtube who has an amv channel or something and wants to use your music all you do is give them the song and it's like you work out they get to use the song don't have to worry about copyright and then i get to get in front of their audience which brings me more fans and i tell people all the time i've done these radio campaigns that cost you know thousands and thousands of dollars many times many different things there's nothing that compares to like anime videos or especially the Minecraft videos because they're so huge. Like just seeing the reaction, the streaming the next day will spike like huge. You just don't see that from like radio and those traditional things. So honestly, like, dude, I feel like it's like, it's probably one of the best things I ever got involved in. I don't know if I'd have the career I have today without YouTube and anime and, and things like that. Hands down, you know? Oh yeah. It, it's almost reminiscent of a uh, MySpace days. Yeah, uh, man. In a sense. Really? Yeah. I mean, how old, when, how old am I? I'm a uh, 29, dude. Okay. Okay. I'm 31 now. So you yeah. said in high school in 05. So I figured we're probably around the same age. Yep. Yep. Around the same age. So, you know, I guess that's uh, cause you said you were listening to like Limp Bizkit and Corn and Linkin Park. I was like, dude, yeah, I, I know all those bands, you know, yep. I grew up listening to all those bands. So, you know, I mean, I, saw Linkin Park during their Meteora tour. So oh, yeah. oh, wow. <laughs> that kind of that kind of dates me right there, you know? Yeah. People like, yeah, who's no. the first band you ever saw? And I I, you know, go like this. I'm like 98 degrees. <laughs> yeah, right. And they're like, who? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. That's that's my point. <laughs> I'm only gonna bring this up just because we're similar in age. I don't know. Did you ever mess with like Pokemon cards back in the day? Uh, I actually still have a golden Mewtwo card from Burger King sitting up on top of my fridge. Oh, really? Because yeah. my son, I have an eight-year-old kid, and he came home from school last week and brought a few Pokemon cards. He's like, oh, dad, look at this. And I was like, dude, I used to do that. So I come down to my basement, like looked around. I finally found my old binder. Dude, I pulled out like a first edition at Dark Charizard. Like I have like six Charizards. I mean, it's crazy, man. Like. And I then saw some your of the post. Values of these things are like <laughs> crazy, man. Yeah, dude, I saw your post on that. I, I may have commented on it. But okay. Yeah, dude. I was like, oh, he has a second edition because as the two with the Pokeball on the side yep. for one of the hollow Charizards, it's like, dude. Dude, and I used to have that first edition when I was a kid. I mean, probably two or three of them. I think they just sold one last year for like three hundred thousand dollars, bro. Yep, like something the, like that. Yeah, a ten first edition, but I have the dark Charizard first edition. Obviously, not worth as much, but cool. And then, yeah, I have that the regular Hollow Charizard, the base set two or whatever second yep. edition. So again, they're cool, but God, I oh, I, I should have had that first, man. Damn it, you know what I'm saying? Okay, man. So you were into Pokemon. Favorite Pokemon of all time? Um, I mean, I'm obviously biased towards Charizard just because of the simple fact of the cards and the fun I have with that. Like, you know, Pikachu's a classic, like almost an icon nowadays. So yeah. then I always liked Blastoise as well. But again, I've been, in terms of newer stuff, I'm completely out of the loop. Like we're talking like it's 1999 right here. So yep. that's all I know, you know. Yep, okay. Um... <laughs> mine's always going to be Mew 
I don't know why. I, I guess it's just the nostalgia of going into the movie theaters and seeing, you know, Mewtwo Strikes Back, you yeah. know, kind of thing. And, you know, it had a killer soundtrack. The voice acting was was on point. The fight scene, you know, between all the clones and everything was awesome. Great message. You know, I, I guess that's that's always, otherwise, dude, <laughs> it has to be a tie between Gengar and Hitmonchan. Oh, okay. Yeah. I actually just found my Hitmonchan today, a, a, an original, like 1999, dude, in mint condition. I, I They're upstairs. Otherwise, I'd show you right now. But dude, it's it's been just uh, like, I'm trying to find other hobbies because I'm so obsessed with music and radio and all the promotional shit that it's basically all I talk about 24 hours a day. So like, right. I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to find something else I can enjoy because, you know, all it is is music talk 24 hours over here about whatever my single is doing. What's the next, you know, it's, yep. but, you know, that's, that's part of the passion I have and the persistence I have to make shit happen. And I think having a mindset like that, or, you know, almost obsession wise, it almost takes having that to be able to make this shit happen, especially nowadays, because it's so hard. I mean, yes, we have access with YouTube and Spotify and all these platforms to get in front of everybody. But when you got, you know, 10,000 other artists trying to do the exact same thing. Like you got to find ways to stand out and anime AMVs, Minecraft, all this shit has been a way to stand out. You know what I'm saying? Fuck. Oh, who yeah. knows? Now we might even get into a Pokemon video sometime soon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Never that's know. awesome. That's the original fat Pikachu, man. And that's, yeah, that's the thing. I talked to it's my actually kids. From the base set too. It's not first edition, but again, yeah. I, I, I mean, dude, literally there's, boxes of these cards laying around and shit so it's just fun you know well see that's kind of what i'm going for with this this interview man is you know i may touch on music but this is more about you for the fans so the fans can get to know who you are as a person because it that too draws people in you know to oh, feel yeah. like they can connect you know that you love anime i'm a huge comic book nerd man i have like i have figures all over the place you okay. know so yeah yeah Super Saiyan 4, Goku chilling over here. I have Spawn. I have the Dark Phoenix. I have the Batman who laughs. I have a Goliath figure from the Gargoyles chilling over here. You know, okay. so like that's so <laughs> awesome, man. I buy, like you can't really see it, but I, I buy like Undertaker action figures. I got like my Michael Myers mask. A couple of action figures over there. Nice, Hulk, old Steve Austin stuff and old yeah, man, school wrestling, like my, dude. Yeah, yeah, man, this is like my studio and stuff down here. A little messy right now, but yeah, man. Dude. That's, and yeah, man, no, that's so cool. Like, so are you pretty much like new? Like, is this new for you? Uh, interviews and stuff. Yeah, it's uh, I just recently started working for Rocket Knight as their uh, like their Michigan correspondent. OK, I, mean, I live right near Grand Rapids. So, you know, I'm in between Detroit, Chicago, Indianapolis. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I'm, dude, I'm going to I'm going to be out there, though, man. We're putting tours together right now. So starting, I think, in mid-May or June or something, I'm going to be doing like two to three week runs for pretty much the rest of the year, you know, two to three weeks, then home for a while. But, dude, I'm going to be out there that way a lot because that's where a lot of my radio support radio still, you know, has a good impact for touring because they can, you know, tell, oh, the show's coming to town, like having a local presence, you know? Right. But yeah, man, I'm going to be out there a lot in your area. So anytime, bro, like if you see a date or something I'm coming through, hit up Tom, the publicist, and he'll put you on the like list and all that. You come to the show for free and all that. So we'll definitely oh, yeah. do that this year, man, 100%. Oh, hell yeah, man. I'm looking forward to that. I've been trying to follow as to what you guys have been doing with music recently through the past few years. And I saw that you guys just released an album. So yes. uh, I do kind of want to touch base on what went through your head while writing that album, because, I mean, I know each album kind of means something to the artist. So, you know, and your For music sure. tends to have a lot of meaning behind it. So I just kind of want to touch base with that real quick as to what was going through your head, your battles, your emotions, um, your ups, your downs with that in the creative processing for sure. So a little bit of context to it, like right about a year ago, I went into treatment like drug rehab. Um, unfortunately, I was like addicted to painkillers, opiates, you know, I mean, fentanyl specifically, which I'm sure you've heard about. I mean, kills oh, everybody yeah. right these days, you know, and dude, at, at that point, right before I went to treatment, I was doing 40 pills a day. Like I would wake up, 
you know, because when you get hooked on these things, you withdraw if you don't have them. So like if I would wake up in the morning and there was no pills around, like, dude, shit goes down real quick. Like you start, fr the oh, it's just a nightmare, dude, withdrawing. So finally, like, Long story short, my wife kind of knew I was up to some shit because I was always acting weird. So I confessed to her, basically. She took me to treatment, did my treatment, you know, came home. I was gone for about 40 days, came home, was doing my counseling and therapy, you know, trying to get not just stopping to use like using, but finding out what causes that, what are what what brings you to this point? You know, I was doing that. And then in May, <clears throat> I broke my hip. And so I was basically stuck in a recliner for three months because I could hardly walk. And I was just playing so much like acoustic guitar. And I started like writing songs on paper like I did when I was like a kid, you know, because the last 10 years, it's all computer, MIDI keyboards, beats and this and that. So all of that happening, you know, change of mindset because I was clean and sober, then kind of being put in place with my hip and kind of just stuck in the moment, like something just happened to where I wanted to go back and make a hard rock sounding album. Like, you know, like new, like th those old school influences. And I worked with this producer back in the day named Brett Hesla. He was the bass player in the band Creed. Do you remember Creed? Yep. And he, uh, yeah, he was in a couple other bands. He produced some big projects and we worked together like seven, eight years ago. So my thing was I drove 2,600 miles with a broken hip to Nashville and back to make this album with the producer that I wanted to make it with because he was going to bring that hard rock stuff out of me. And content, like, like we were talking about the battles and shit that goes on is like, man, that's why I called the album 1990 because that's the year I was born. And I felt like this was kind of like a reset for me, not just musically, but in life, basically. So 1990 to me is almost like my first album, like my the first, like back, you know, I can't say it's the first because it's obviously not, but it feels like it is, you know? Right. And it was really dealing with like the death of my mom from a heroin overdose when I was nine. My father committed suicide in 2017, also from a heroin overdose, which are both opiates, you know? So mm -hmm. that's why last year I have my eight-year-old kid and all of a sudden I'm the one there. You know, it was almost like I was seeing the roles reversed. So dealing with all that, dealing with the shit I've had to the hip, the this and that. And I just, man, I, I tried my best to put it in the music and lyrically and made it, you know, it wasn't about, is this going to be the biggest hit? We need more hip hop beats. So it's more popular. It was just about whatever sounds great to me and the producer at that time. That's what we're going for. Whatever feels the most real, not giving a shit about, Oh, is it going to be a hit? You know, you can worry about that, but you know what I mean? So it was really just trying to take a lot of what I just said. I know it's a lot, but trying to cram it all into an album and do it like the proper way, you know, and I'm proud of this album. This is probably the most proud of project I've ever done. So, and again, it just kind of came out, you know, what, two months ago, a month and a half, whatever it was. So I think it's still got a lot of life left. Got to get out of here is climbing the charts right now. And that'll probably go for another six weeks till it peaks. And then we'll probably go to the next single. Um, and yeah, man, I'm just kind of taking it from there, trying to spend the year promoting and then going on the road. But no, man, deep. Uh, I tried to make it as deep as possible, for sure. It's definitely deep, man. Um, I've been listening to the album, you know, like uh, the song Back Into Darkness. I think that's at around like 18,000 streams or something like that. And for yeah. only being out for a month, dude, that's really good. Yeah, I mean, you know? for no no like real promotion or nothing like that. Like on Spotify, Gotta Get Out of Here is almost at half a million already. And then Clear Skies, which might be the second single, is over 100,000. And then some of the album cuts, like you said, 15, 20, you know, but that's kind of expected, you know, like, mm -hmm. got to get out of here at almost 500,000 because, you know, there's the Minecraft video, there's the radio, there's like a lot of push going into it. So hopefully throughout the year, I'm going to be able to get to all these songs, give them the kind of promotion they deserve so that it can keep building. You know what I'm saying? Most definitely. Yeah. I, I definitely understand that. And you know, I think what's really going to help and, and reach people is just how much of yourself you put into this album. You know, a lot right. of people feel, especially in this day and age, because I would say that drug usage is a pandemic. And in, in this day right. and age, a lot of people use, you know, opiates and whatnot to escape the atrocities of everyday America now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I definitely feel a lot of people are really going to um, experience that. And as to the heroin um, thing, I feel that, man. I uh, I had 
uh, it was my ex-wife's father, um, stepfather who passed away from that. He chose that and, you know, took his life from it and left behind an eight-year-old son. And I have the saddest fucking picture because, you know, I do photography. A little boy standing there by a coffin that's raised up in the National Cemetery, just him by himself with his head down on that coffin. You know, and I'm like, dude, that's fucking that, deep. And then that, I listen to your that, album and I'm like, I feel that like that, that it's there. It's tangible. You yeah. can just hear it and feel the gravity of it. Dude, like you just said, the picture and I haven't even seen the picture, but just from what you described, like to me, that's almost like there it is. That is America's opiate epidemic right there in one picture sums it all up. A little kid. And again, bro, I was that kid, literally, like literally at the same age, close enough. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, man, that's why I like a song. I don't know if you've heard Clear Skies yet, but yep. Clear Skies like that is kind of all about that kind of shit. Because I wrote that hook, the, you know, in the chorus, it does the now. You work on every night, you know. Yep. I wrote that like 10, 15 years ago, kind of about all that. And then the second part where it says no more waiting for the storm to come looks like clear skies was like almost a sad way of me saying like, I, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Like that, like my mom and the heroin and the like, it's 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 basically fucked up what happened. But after all these years later, like your pers the perspective has to change a little bit. Otherwise, you get stuck just like what happened to me last year getting hooked on drugs myself like you can really you can almost fuck yourself up by by being stuck in that like because it's so bad you know and i'm sorry if this sounds weird but you know what i'm saying yeah Where it's like you got to find your way to get through it and no you no, you can't make anyone get sober you can't threaten them and say oh i'm gonna leave you or divorce you or call the police you get sober you go to treatment it's never going to happen unless the person wants to do it a switch has to flip to say all right i'm done like I have to be, that's what happened to me. And I told everyone in treatment, like, you'd be shocked when you change your mindset. That was the biggest factor of me, like straightening my shit up. And I'm over like 400 days now off the fentanyl, man. So. Hell yeah, dude. Congratulations, bro. That's good shit. And uh, I think a lot of people who may be struggling with addictions too, if they listen to your music, they'll, they'll pick it up. You know, Absolutely. that could, that very well could save lives, you know, and yeah. it probably has. That's well, the best again, part. Like I was saying earlier, like with some of the DMs I get and just again, man, that's why that part of this strip away all the bullshit, not bullshit, but, you know, I want to be famous. I want to be a rock star. I want to be rich. Of course, we all want these things. Some people do. <laughs> but when you strip all that away and there's a connection from the art you create that helps someone else's life. Like I said, to me, there's not a payoff that's better than that in this line of work, so to speak. You know, I can agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I can definitely agree with that. Man, it, it's it's just kind of surreal, you know, because you, you say that and then to actually speak to someone who actually wrote some of the stuff that helped you, but then to also hear it from fans and just to kind of get get inside your head a little bit. You know, it, it's so re relatable. You know, it, it, sure. you're proving that you're just like everyone else. And, you know, I think that's really what a lot of people want is to be able to see the artist not as some larger than life person, because a lot of people are really intimidated about speaking to, you know, their favorite artist or, you know, an artist. And, you know, some people are just like, um, uh, um, 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 you know, but then when you're just like, oh, hey, dude, you watch Pokemon, you, you do Minecraft stuff, you know, it, you know, fans like seeing that. And I'm hoping that what I'm doing here can help bring you more fans and help bring people out, you know, to your shows and stuff because they, they can relate. Well, and there again, man, you're, you're be, us being able to do something like this you know, it's not going to be just the same. Oh, how'd you come up with your band name? Blah, blah, blah. Like, no. we all know this. We've heard it. You can find 20 interviews I did last week about it. But yep. being able to talk about other things, like it's Pokemon cards or diving into real life shit that we're talking about that does affect so many people. I think it's a win-win for everyone involved. Even if no one knows who I am or you and someone stumbles across it, it's a conversation that could be worth something, you know? Yeah. And again, man, that's the shit to me that means a lot, you know, so... Hell yeah, man. So uh, you brought up earlier that, uh, you know, obviously you and I are only two years apart. Yep. Um, Lincoln Park and and stuff like that. Did did they have like a large influence on you? Because I, I feel I feel that they did have an influence. I mean, we're, we're 90s kids. Of course, they had an influence on us. What the hell am I talking about? But 
you know, not a lot of people have actually went off and played off the music influences with that. And I can kind of feel some of their influence in their, you know, earlier Linkin Park, um, like yeah. hybrid theory, Meteora yeah. vibes in some yeah. of your music, man. I would definitely say so, man. I mean, you know, I don't know how long you've been following me or checking out, but I used to have this guy, Roman. Do you remember Roman or no? Uh, he was- 2016 kind of like a solo artist i have band members and shit but it's you know it's pretty much i do all this you know but i always had this guy who was with me for a long time and he was obsessed with lincoln park i mean obsessed i always dug him and stuff but you know it, at the time i wasn't so much into him until actually a few like maybe 2005 i started getting into it but yeah man now like especially now you can just because of them doing the kind of new metal thing but having a lot of the hip-hop beats I mean, a lot of what people do now, really, like with the rock and adding some of that shit in. But yeah, man, I would say Linkin Park out of like, if we're talking like corn and I was never a big corn or limp. I mean, at the time I had my phases and stuff, but a band like Linkin Park is someone I could definitely cite as an influence. And even beyond that, I mean, I go back to like 70s Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne in the 80s, you know, Metallica, Guns N' Roses. I mean, to me, I always feel like that's like the real me, Black Sabbath. You know what I'm saying? Like, so oh, yeah. I, I like to take, so in a way you could say like, I take those old influences of like Sabbath and Ozzy and Metallica and then combine them with the influences of like a Lincoln Park where you bring some of that hip hop vibe in and, and it's cool, man. I think that's what's so fun is that you can, these days you can really, you don't, you know, you can almost do whatever the fuck you want, basically. Like if this is the music I'm feeling, hopefully the fans like it, which they typically do and all works out, you know, but you gotta be willing to take the risk, you know? Most definitely. And you've definitely done that. Yeah, man. I've uh, been following you guys since around 2016. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's been a while. I mean, I've been, I've been watching your progress throughout all that time, you know, so that's why I, I hope you've seen some good progress. I, I like, it, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, you're still around. That's a lot more than I can that's say for, than a lot of people, you know, some people like, Oh, we put this out. We didn't get what we wanted. Okay. We're done. We're going to break yep. up. Dude. All the time. <laughs> actually a close musician friend of mine he always tells me he's like bro it's not about who's the biggest right now or who does this but it's going to be about who's around in 20 years from now still doing it still standing and in a way I mean in many ways that is true man because even in the short and it's not short time for me but in the short time I've been like a real artist in like the music industry with songs on the radio and shit I've seen so many artists come and go man like in a short amount of time and so again, I mean, I think I'm going to be one of these guys, no matter what happens. I mean, hopefully I live long, but you know, 20 years from now, I'll still be here doing this if I'm allowed to, you know, right as of now, there's no sign of it slowing down. In fact, like these are my biggest years. The last two years have been my biggest years to date. And it's looking like 2022 is going to be no different. So it's all on an upward swing, man. And I couldn't ask for anything more than that. That's what I'm looking for, man. I, I'm glad to hear that. Um, here's a question, and you're probably asked this all the fucking time. Okay. Um, if you could tour with one band, who would it be? Like, like a band that's around right now. If you could tour with one, who would it be? So someone who's around right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'd have a couple. I mean, it's hard to to say I wouldn't love to do a Post Malone tour because that is like the epitome of mainstream success, you know. Mm-hmm. But you know, if I had to go out with someone right now, I mean, I would love to go out with like Metallica or like a Guns N' Roses or something. I mean, uh, just be going out to be able to open for one of these like legendary iconic artists that are still killing it. I mean, it'd be a dream come true. Obviously, I'd love to play with Ozzy. But again, who knows how much more he's going to be out there. But see there again, man, it's like I wish I could say, oh, I'd love to tour with this huge rock band that's current. But the thing is, there's not a ton of these rock bands, even the ones that are kind of big for today, like they don't really play places that are that much bigger than I already play, like clubs and theaters, because none right. of the new ones are out doing 20,000 seat arenas or nothing. That's usually like the Post Malones and Imagine yep. Dragons of the world, you know? Yeah. So, somewhere in there. But yeah, I mean, Metallica would be awesome. And again, I'll, dude, I'll go out tour with anybody who will have me, you know? So oh, yeah. like Adelita's Way is a band I toured with the last couple of years. They're a newer band. Killer guys, man. Multiple number one singles. But again, you know, we're out doing clubs and theaters, 500 to 1,000 people, you know. And But dude, oh, yeah. some, those 500 seat nights, they feel like you're playing in front of 20,000 people, man. 
Well, I think that a lot of the smaller clubs allow the artists to interact more with the fans. You know, I mean, I, I totally get the arena. I get the arena vibe, though, man. Legit, like the arena vibe feels because, I mean, I I'm going to go see like a Slipknot here coming up, you know, on yeah. their whole road road tour. I'm that yeah, would be another band I'd love to tour with. It just as an example. Well, I mean, I'm catching them with Cypress Hill, which, you know, I never thought would ever happen. I'm like, that's crazy. You know, Cypress Hill and Slipknot together. What? You know, (laughs) stuff like that, you know, or uh, shoot, who else? There was one other band I was going to see. Oh, yeah. Static X got canceled. So it was, oh, Lamb of God uh, and Megadeth. You know, their whole thing. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you get all those, you're like, oh, this is so cool. But I feel that shows like that take away from the overall experience because you can't be up close and then you don't really have like um there's places because i originally came from like south bend you know there's clubs that where you would find the artist like uh here's a shout out to alessandro pavari from uh gemini syndrome i saw oh, him yeah. opening up uh with uh avatar a few years ago and he was just walking around the bar before the show yeah. just drinking talking with fans and everything you know Dude, no one yeah. really knew who he was but they had a great conversation and five minutes later he's like oh hey i gotta go and you see him up on stage, like that dude just took the time out to speak with me. You know, some just yeah, regular man. dude. You know, that's what I like about smaller venues and stuff. And, and I do the same thing, bro. I'm out there chilling and hanging, and I mean, because it's like that's part of the work you put in. But but again, to someone like like to your point, it's like, man, if you sit there and are chatting with someone for even five minutes, and it's like you you know put a smile on their face, like dude, that's what it's all about. It's about the connection. It's not like oh, I'm a rock star. Like bow down. Yep. To me. You know, it's like, dude, we're all people. We're all here trying to have a good time tonight. Let's have some fun. Let's hang out. And yeah, in an arena situation, I've been fortunate to open a couple shows in those bigger. And yeah, man, it's a lot like you can just walk out there and you, you know what I'm saying? So there yeah. is definitely something special about the club shows. And uh, you said South Bend. Yeah. Yeah. Indiana. South Bend. Yep. Indiana. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm from Indiana. And yeah, there's a little club in, in South Bend called Cheers. Are you familiar used to, with that? That's where I saw Gemini Syndrome. Yeah, okay. I used to know the old owners. Um, I was friends with Danielle and her mother before okay. they sold it. And now Danielle owns a bar called That Sports Bar in Indianapolis now. Okay, okay. Uh, gotcha. they, sh- they shut down Um, because you're you're familiar with South Bend then. Uh, Smith's downtown got shut down, okay. which was unfortunate. Um, a lot of big acts came through there. Dope um let's see there was dope there was uh non-point uh head pe bands like that so that place closed down a couple times and they're cool like when you you know start going on tour it's like oh we got this date you can open for like so all of a sudden you'd be on tour then you just get to open these random shows like just one-offs one night i did with head pe one night i did with like seven dust and non-point and it's cool it's like Dude, a few years before, it's like, these are the bands I was listening to. And then all of a sudden, like, I become one of their peers where I know a lot of these guys. They know me. You end up doing shows together. It's so cool, man. So, like, it feels so good. It's like, like, Adelaide's Way is another one. Mm-hmm. I remember when I was, like, 19, bro. Like, I'd hear that shit on the radio all the time and always dug them. And who would have known that me and the singer Rick would end up, like, pretty close friends and go on tour. And it's just, it's wild, man. It's so wild. It is, man. Perseverance and persistence. You know, if, if you keep to the path, you know, and don't give up on your dreams and aspirations, you can make it. I tell that to people all the time, man. It doesn't matter how long the journey is. If you keep going, you'll eventually reach your destination. You just have to keep going. You can't stop. And, and a lot of people don't realize that the journey itself is really everyone always thinks like oh I, i'm trying to get here and i'm trying to get there which is great to have those long-term goals too but i've at least in my experience i notice every time i do that by the time i almost get there i look back and be like wow man the the journey getting here is the shit you're going to remember the stuff you have to go through you know like you know two years from now i might look back on times like this and be like man how crazy was that that was going on you don't realize it while you're right there in the moment you know until you kind of look back they always say hindsight is 2020 you know you can see everything <laughs> perfectly yep. in the future you know, you know so it's cool man and at the end of the day that's all i can ask for is to keep keep on the journey and having more moments you know you reminded me of captain hindsight right there i thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah <laughs> south park reference yeah yeah, yeah. So you're from Indiana, man. Where in Indiana are you from? Yeah, I grew up uh, right outside of a town called Gary, Indiana, right in Griffith, northwest Indiana, about 20 miles, 30 miles out of Chicago. 
So right up there on the border, Griffith, yep. Crown Point, Merrillville, Highland kind of area. I don't know if you're familiar. Gary's like the one everyone seems to know, not for good reasons, but uh, I used to live in Gary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, bro, like 10 minutes from there, man. Yeah. Um, I actually lived off of in Chicago off of Michigan in 73rd for a minute. Um okay. definitely a place, you know, no one yeah should be. <laughs> yeah, sure. But uh when when you think about it, you're like, oh Gary, Gary. But then when you actually hear stories about Gary and someone who's actually been through, they're like, Yeah, that's no bullshit, that's real. <laughs> Dude, and there that was a happen. long time where Gary was like the n- murder capital of the world for a couple of years, where they had more homicides per capita there than anywhere else in the nation. Man. Dude, legit the cops say at night, if there's a red light, just roll through it. Yeah, just roll through it. Don't <laughs> yeah. stop. Do not no. stop. Keep going. Just roll through. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's real shit. You know, they weren't yeah. saying that just to be nice. They were being dead serious. They don't want to have to try and investigate a body that they find in a house three blocks down. Dude, 100 percent. And yeah, <laughs> so, out there, man. yeah, man, it, it's funny how our uh, surroundings can also influence how we feel and how we grow up, influence who we become as as adults, you know, as to either we want to be that way or not be that way. Absolutely. So, Yep. No. And that's something I talk about, like with my wife and my therapy and counseling and all that all the time, man, it's real, you know? Dude, I lived in all the shit parts of Indiana, Vincent's, Washington, <laughs> Evansville, Terre Haute, yep, yep. Erie, South Bend, Elkhart, Mishawaka. <laughs> Dude, I played in Elkhart even a couple of years ago. Really? What, RJ's what place? Pub. RJ's pub. I think it was. I know RJ's. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Dude, see, wow. what a small world. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, I feel like I'm keeping you from something, man. And am, am I taking up any of your time? No, bro. This was because I just heard my son come in and shit. Like, oh, it's all good though. No worries, man. Just just making sure, man. You no, know, I d- I don't like taking up anyone's time. You know, people are busy, people have lives. Well, maybe yeah. maybe another couple minutes and then we'll wrap it up. But but like I said, man, and, and again, if you want to do follow ups in a couple months or something like again, I love chatting with people like you and shit. So, yeah, man, anytime, bro, for real. Most definitely. Um, All right. I'm going to get some of the questions out Um, that yeah, need to be no done. Pressure. for. I like, don't feel like you're taking my time or nothing. I'm sorry if I'm putting off that vibe. I, I just nah, keep you're good. There, so we're all you're, good. <laughs> you're all good, man. Um, When on tour, is there anything that you have to have when you're on tour? Um, well, I have to have my backpack because, I mean, I know that might sound like kind of an obvious answer, but you know, like I carry a lot of, well, I shouldn't say backpack. I have like this Louis Vuitton sling bag, you know, like a Mm -hmm. bag or whatever. But because when I'm on the road, I have like expensive jewelry, like medications. I just like to have a little bag that's basically with me all times. My wallet, like all my important shit is in there. Right. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, you know, nothing crazy other than that, you know, pretty much the usual stuff, but just trying to think, you know, other than that, not really. I mean, obviously I got to have my instruments and shit, but no, nah, just, I like to have my bag with all my immediate shit. You know, there might be 10 grand worth of jewelry sitting in it, plus my wallet, cards, basically all the important shit. I like to have it close by at all times. So, right um foods or places you have to stop when you're on the road like uh, i spoke to one band the other day and they said they have to stop at a place called yaya's you know so you know like is there any specific place that if you see it on the road you have to stop there dude all over the country every region has a place i like to stop at so like obviously (laughs) when i find a white castle you probably don't care because you're used to it but i gotta stop at white castle even towards like Indianapolis, there's a substation called Penn Station. You familiar yep. with that? Yep. So they don't have these everywhere. Um, obviously another Chicago one is Portillo's. Anytime I see a Portillo's, yes. I gotta get a beef sandwich. Yeah. You know. Um, and then let's see here. I love Jack in the Box once in a while. Yeah. Um, you know, so places like that. Um. Yeah, White Castle and Penn Station. Those are like the ones. Anytime I see one, I have to stop. So. Those are probably my favorite. I was just recording in Nashville, this album, 1990, actually over the summer. And there was a Penn station right next to my hotel. And I swear to God, I had five sandwiches in like a week and a half while I was there. So <laughs> I love it. Man. I can't blame you for that one, man. There's, we actually don't really have any White Castles near us here. Okay. You have to go to like Michigan City in oh, Indiana. Wow. 
yeah. to get one. So yeah, White Castle is kind of rarity. I had some on like New Year's. We have like 30 some of like the sliders. Oh so. yeah. <laughs> um Penn Station. Yeah, love that. Um there's one in South Bend. They just built yeah. a Pertillos in South Bend. Which, no shit. No shit. I love it. Oh. Yep. Right near Notre Dame or right down the street from Notre Dame. Okay. So yep. In fact, I think because isn't um Elkhart pretty close to South Bend, basically right next to each other? Or am I got 15, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah, it's connected remember, by Lincoln Way. Okay, because I remember when when I was playing in Elkhart, I think we drove to South Bend to get uh, uh Penn Station, or it was right there in Elkhart. I can't remember, but I just know I had Penn Station there. There was a Penn Station right next to IHOP in Mishawaka. Okay, that uh, might be it then. Yep. I know of that one for sure. As to whether or not it's still open, I don't know. I've been out of Indiana yeah. for like three years. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, I'm gone. I, I want to move. So where are you at now then? Uh, I am living in Benton Harbor, <laughs> which is Benton Harbor right next to St. Joseph, Michigan. It's like a, it's like the ghetto, I guess. People call Benton Harbor the ghetto, but I'm like an hour from Grand Rapids and I'm oh, 55 right. minutes okay. from uh, South Bend. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. You're all good, dude. Michigan, man. I moved here, um, for, you know, the, the recreational stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and I have a lot of health issues. Um, I'm a cancer survivor and stuff, and I'm a type one diabetic with tons of nerve damage. So go somewhere where that, uh, stuff is legal. Wow. Yeah, no, no. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I like to smoke too. You know what I'm saying? That's about I, all I do nowadays, but hey man, it helps. You know, that's yeah. that's the thing. It really is a medicine. That's crazy um, to do that though, man. I'm glad I, I hope you're doing well and shit. So oh, yeah, dude. I I'm thriving here, man. Uh photography, photojournalism, collecting figures, uh, talking to just musicians, you know, who've made I try to do the musician thing, and I just found that my love is uh, helping musicians, yeah. promoting them, you know, because well, a lot of musicians what you're doing are... right now, man. I think long term, keeping something like this going, trying to do interviews with like artists of all types of genres and shit. I think it's awesome, man. I'm glad there's younger dudes like you doing this type of thing. I hope you do it for a long time, man. For real. Oh, I don't plan on quitting, man. I enjoy helping people, you know. And uh, I'm Flint, uh, Flint, I am about two and a half hours okay because i know i'm playing there sometime i know that's kind of ghetto too but they have a venue called the machine shop there like minty everybody loves yeah yeah Minty does yeah i'm friends with jeff uh on yeah, yeah. he's facebook. done a bunch of my pictures and shit back in the day man yep jeff yeah, i'm friends cool. with him on facebook uh yeah um i i can try and get there for sure um yeah, i'm sure I i'll get to... closer i was just throwing that out because we were talking michigan and stuff oh yeah um there's the machine shop there's the music factory which is yep. um, battle, battle creek, creek yep. which is like too far probably for me. 10 times oh is yep. that close to you battle creek yeah battle creek's pretty close i'm friends with jeff harris the owner yeah yeah yep. yeah yeah dude yep. yeah my friend is actually playing there this saturday i think another lost year is, is yeah that. I saw them, uh, they did the Bears Big Growl a few years ago. Um, yeah. I think when Scott Stapp actually did, uh, yeah. when Scott Stapp played. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, the guy who sings for that, he's like my tour manager and he shoots all my videos and shit. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, man. Well, well, yeah, I'll be, we're doing the uh, Battle Creek and shit. So yeah, man, like I said, we'll just like keep a lookout for those dates as I announce them and stuff. But yeah, man. Right on. Cool shit. Um, thank you. Dude, that'd be awesome. And again, bro, I can't thank you enough for having me on your platform. It means a lot. And again, I hope we can do it again in the very near future. I love building relationships, especially with certain journalists, because it's cool to, you know, especially as both people go, you build a story, not just me, but you have your own story. And it's just cool to watch people grow together. And 20 years from now, I might be the biggest artist and you might be the biggest guy interviewing the people. So you never know, bro. You know what I'm you saying? You never know. All right, man. Well, you have a wonderful night. Thanks for speaking with me, Kyle. Dude, you too, Jacob. I seriously appreciate it. Did I get the name right or no? Yeah. Yeah, you're good, dude. That's my name. <laughs> All right. Later, dude.